last time um, we were doing a couple more applications of the random walk. So one of them is combining different error sources. So if delta x1 is the average magnitude of error from source one and delta x2 is the average magnitude of error from source two to combine them correctly, we add them in quadrature, meaning you square them, add them, then take the square root to get the total average uncertainty. Then we also, another application of the random walk was to diffusion. And we showed that the RMS displacement from the start of a time period to the end of a time period is the square root of 2 dt, where d is the diffusion constant, which Einstein showed is the mobility mu times kbt. And we discussed how smaller objects have a larger mobility. Um, then we also talked about water pressure, and we showed that the pressure at a depth h is the pressure of atmosphere plus this term that's proportional to the depth. And we use that in our discussion of osmosis where we have some solution. The case that we talked about was sugar, but it could be any kind of solute on the left side here and pure water on the right. The pure water is gonna go through the small pores in the semi-permeable membrane, but anything else can't get through. And we showed that in equilibrium, there is a pressure difference between the two sides called the osmotic pressure, which is equal to rho GH if that pressure difference is being supplied by a height difference. And in general, it's N over V times RT. I incorrectly said yesterday that N over V is the molarity. It is the concentration, but this would be moles per cubic meter. Um, so I suppose it depends on the value of R they're using, but that's the way I encourage you to think about it questions about any of that. Okay, so osmosis is, oh, so before I get into the material, I just want to remind you that we have our optional review session, not a review session, question and answer session, Monday at our normal meeting time, and later today, or perhaps over the weekend, um, uh, later today or Saturday morning, I'll be send, sending out, posting the list of topics and some practice questions. Um, so osmosis is quite important in biology, um, but I wanna talk about a physics application of osmosis, which relates to one of the big challenges that we as humanity are gonna be facing over the next 10 to 20 years, which is an adequate supply of drinking water. So this is partly a consequence of global climate change and partly a consequence of demographics that getting enough drinking water to people is gonna become a really hard problem uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. Part of the solution might be a process called reverse osmosis. So this is a way to purify water. So for example, to purify to get pure drinking water from salt water. And um, the way this process works is we've got this semi-permeable membrane. And let's say we have salt water, like seawater on the left side, and we're trying to create pure water on the right. So if we've already got some pure water on the right, we know that there's an equilibrium between water going from right to left and left to right when the total pressure on the left is equal to the osmotic pressure plus the um, pressure of water. Um, so let's say if the pressure of water on the right is equal to atmospheric pressure, so it's just like a tank that's exposed to the air, then if we have the same pressure of water on the left side, that is equal to one atmosphere, and we add in this osmotic pressure that we were talking about last time, then we're at equilibrium. So this gives equilibrium. So that means, remember that the impact frequency of water molecules on this semi-permeable membrane is proportional to the pressure of water. So if we increase the pressure on the left side, we can start to preferentially drive water from the salt water side to the pure water side, increasing it above this total pressure. So, so let's call this P sub equilibrium. 
So for P greater than P equilibrium, water flows to the right. meaning we'd have a net flow of water this way. So I want to compare, so in that way, that's a way of producing pure water from seawater. I want to compare the en energy efficiency of this method of producing pure water compared to the more conventional way, which is distillation. And so when we think about the energy needed to produce water by this reverse osmosis process, um, reverse osmosis because the water is flowing in opposite the direction that you normally think of for osmosis. You have to do work to push the water through this membrane. So let's think about pushing a cubic meter of water through the membrane. So here's a cubic meter and it's part way through the membrane. So this is something that measures one meter on each side, one cubic meter. And um, we are gonna do this. So obviously, maybe it's not obvious, but the higher you are above this equilibrium pressure, the faster the reverse osmosis flows. But we will find out quite soon that the amount of power that you have to supply to produce this pure water goes up the higher this pressure difference is. So let's say that we're going to be patient and try to produce the pure water in the most energy efficient way. So we're going to keep, we're going to be only tiny bit above this equilibrium pressure. So for math purposes, let's assume we're at this equilibrium pressure on the left, atmospheric pressure on the right. So the net pressure difference is equal to the osmotic pressure. Um, and so what I want you to do is to calculate the work done. So assuming P left equals P equilibrium equals P right plus the osmotic pressure. Your book uses the symbol pi for this osmotic pressure. And we talked about the value of that last time, whoops. Assuming that pressure difference, what is the work needed to push one cubic meter of water through the membrane? Now, in order to do that calculation, you need to know the concentration of salt in the left, left side. So seawater has a molarity of about 0 0.6 in salt, so moles per liter of salt. And so part of your job is to convert that to moles per cubic meter, but maybe I'll just tell you that there are 1,000 liters in a cubic meter. Um, and we're going to be doing this at room temperature. So that's 20 degrees Celsius. And I think that's all you need. So I'm gonna break you up into breakout rooms now. So again, your goal is calculate how much work do we need to push the one cubic meter of water through that semi-permeable membrane. Are there any questions before I divide you up into the breakout rooms?
Okay. Um, I think we're all back. Kevin, can you walk us through this, please? Uh, yeah. So the work would be equal to the force times um, displacement since the cosine would be uh, zero. So in general, work is force dotted into distance. So that's FR cos theta. But the force and the displacement are both in the same direction. So the cos theta is just one. So maybe let's call it the displacement is D. So work is force times D. Go ahead. Um, so that would be the osmotic pressure times the area times the displacement. So force is pressure times area. And the pressure in this case is the osmotic pressure pi times D. Go ahead. So that would uh, area times displacement would equal the volume. So, so the area is the cross-sectional area as seen looking from this direction. So A times D is equal to the volume which is one cubic meter in our case. Go ahead. And then um, simplifying the osmotic pressure, it would be uh, the number of moles divided by, or the molarity times R times T. So it's moles per volume times R times T, good. And our volume is one cubic meter. And what's uh, the number of moles? Oh, I think I used the, just the given value of 0 0.6 moles per liter. Okay, but we want the number of moles in a cubic meter. You could do it that way if you chose one liter as your volume here, but I wanna keep with V equals one cubic meter. So if we have 0.6 moles per liter, a thousand liters in a cubic meter, that means our number of moles will be 600. So work, the, the two volumes cancel, this volume here and this volume here are going to cancel. And so the work is just equal in this case to NRT. So that's 600 moles times R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin uh, times T, which is 293 Kelvin. And Kevin, did you plug in the numbers on this? Yeah, I got 1.46 million joules. 1.46 million joules, good. Which sounds like a lot, but bear in mind that a cubic meter, it's a lot of water, a thousand liters of water. So maybe it's not surprising that it takes a lot of energy to purify that. Questions? Um, how did you get um, the osmotic pressure times the areas, the force? Um, from the general relationship between the, the definition of pressure is force per area. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Allison. Um, why are you using Kelvin here? Um, we, whenever we write temperature, it's always in Kelvin. So T, like in PV equals NRT, that temperature is in Kelvin. Other questions? So that means when it's given in Celsius, you have to convert it to Kelvin? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so now we're gonna compare that 1.46 megajoules per cubic meter of water to the process of distillation. And when you're distilling the water, you have to do two things. Step one, you've got to heat it from room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. And for that part, I will remind you that the specific heat of water is 4182 joules per kilogram Kelvin and that the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed which is equal to a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. But then you've got to vaporize it. So you've got to convert from liquid to gas. So you're at the boiling point, but it's still a liquid. When it's in the liquid form, let's look at the molecular level. So here's a water molecule. When you take intro chemistry, they will talk about how 
oxygen is kind of an electronegative atom, meaning it tends to draw um, partial negative charge toward itself, leaving a partial positive charge on the two hydrogens. Next semester, you're going to learn about how opposite charges attract. And so if I have another water molecule, let's say like this, the positive charge on this hydrogen will be attracted to the negative charge on that oxygen. That forms a kind of weak bond between them, which is called a hydrogen bond. So it's about one tenth as strong as a covalent bond. But that's still significant, especially when you're thinking about all the water put together. Every single oxygen atom is hydrogen bonded to another hydrogen. And in order to move from liquid to gas, you've got to break all those hydrogen bonds, which means you have to pull the molecules apart. You have to put work in to pull them apart. It means you have to put in energy. So to separate the molecules, meaning to move them from being a liquid to a gas, you must add what's called the latent heat. That's just a measure of the amount of energy to break the hydrogen bonds. And there's an analogous thing for any transition from a liquid to a gas. The amount of energy needed for water is sort of unusually high. Um, so the latent heat, we could use the symbol L, is equal to, in the case of water, 40.8 kilojoules per mole. So it's proportional to the amount, the heat is proportional to the amount of material or 2260 kilojoules per kilogram. So again, I want you to do the calculation of how much energy is needed to purify the water by this distillation process. And you've got to think about the energy needed for both of these two steps. Questions before I put you back in your breakout rooms? Okay.
Okay, Sydney, can you walk us through it, please? Um, so for the first part, uh, you can use Q equals MC delta T. Mm -hmm. And um, we can convert uh, one cubic meter of water to uh, kilograms using the density mm -hmm. multiplied by. So M is a thousand kilograms. C we know is 4182 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Go ahead. And then the T is 100 minus 20 degrees Celsius, so 80. So 80 Kelvin, which is equal to 80 Celsius because we're talking about a delta T. And so when you plug in those numbers, what did you get? We got 3.35 times 10 to the eighth joules. So a lot of joules, right? 335 megajoules. But then we also have to boil the water. So how how did you do that calculation, Sydney? Um, so you can convert one uh, meter cubed into kilograms again, and then just multiply it by the latent heat. So the heat required to boil the water is just the mass times the latent heat, which is a thousand kilograms times twenty two sixty kilojoules per kilogram. And did you have time to plug in the numbers on that, Sydney? Uh, looks like it's 2.26 times 10 to the 6. Uh, 10 to the 9, I think, because this is kilojoules. And oh, yeah, to, yeah. So 10 to the 9 joules. So 2.26 billion joules. So when you add the two together, it's about 2, two and a half billion joules. So way, way more than what we got before for the R reverse osmosis, which was 1.5 million joules. So this is like a thousand times more energy, more than a thousand times more energy. Now, to be fair, we did the, the reverse osmosis, which is abbreviated RO, we did that process sort of in the slowest, most energy efficient way. In real life, you would apply a bigger pressure difference between the two sides. So maybe that would double your energy cost, but still you'd be hundreds of times less energy than doing distillation. Now, there are technical problems with using reverse osmosis for purifying salt water. The, you need a lot of this uh, semi-permeable membrane, and it's pretty delicate. It gets clogged up easily, so you have to have some cycle built into your apparatus that flushes it on a regular basis. But still, uh, this is a, a promising technology um, which is being used in some locations to purify water. Questions? Okay, so in the time that remains, we're going to um, sort of step away from all the stuff that we've been talking about recently and just do one last important thing, um, which is to talk about differential equations. And in the 15 minutes that I've got left, I'm obviously not gonna make you experts in differential equations, but you are going to hear this term differential equations when you go to talks in any field of quantitative science. And I want you to understand what is meant by it, even if you are an expert in solving differential equation systems. So, so that's our goal, is just to get you to the point where you understand what a differential equation means and what that word, the solution to a differential equation means. As an example, we're gonna consider something that is important to us, which is a mass on a spring. And it's important because as we've talked about, any system that's in equilibrium can be modeled as a mass on a spring. So let's say we have a spring of spring constant K, a mass of mass M, they're riding on a frictionless surface. We're going to measure the displacement of the mass, excuse me, relative to its equilibrium position. So that displacement we're gonna call X. And we're gonna kind of pull the mass to the right and let it go and watch it bounce back and forth. So that's like, I've got this mass vertically. We showed earlier that a vertical mass is equivalent mathematically to a horizontal mass. So it's like pulling this up and then letting it go. And we're gonna ask the question, what is the position as a function of time. So 
what we're about to do is representative of maybe about half of research level theoretical physics, which is trying to find a differential equation that describes the system and then trying to find the solution to that differential equation. If we're talking about mechanical systems, the way that we generate the differential equation is often by using Newton's second law. So we're going to apply Newton's second law, F equals MA. I don't need the vector signs because this is a one dimensional problem. The force in this case is equal to the spring force, which is given by Hooke's law, minus K times the displacement away from equilibrium. M times A, so A remember is the derivative with respect to time of the velocity and the velocity is in turn the derivative with respect to time of the position. So I could write this as M times the second derivative of X with respect to time which we write as D squared X by DT squared. And so equating that to the spring force, we get minus kx equals m d squared x by dt squared. So this is an example of a differential equation abbreviated DEQ. So differential equation is, I'll remind you, sorry, that x is a function of time. The position of the mass depends on time. So differential equation is simply an equation containing a function, in this case x of t, and its derivatives, in this case d squared x by dt squared. So it's nothing that you should be intimidated by, it's just a different kind of equation and in fact you've already been using equations like this in this class. The next step after you find the differential equation, so you use some basic piece of physics like F equals MA to find the differential equation that describes the system under study, is you want to find the solution to the differential equation. So the solution to a DEQ is a function that allows the equal sign to hold. And to illustrate what I mean, I want to show you a function that is not a solution. So not a solution to our differential equation would be x equals a t squared. So let's prove that this is not a solution to our differential equation. So to check, we're going to plug it in, plug in this proposed solution to our differential equation. And we'll see that it doesn't work. So that is, we're going to plug it in to this differential equation minus kx equals m d squared x by dt squared. So minus, uh, I'm, yeah, minus k times x, which is at squared, equals, and I'll put a question mark over it because that's what we're checking, m times d squared by dt squared of a t squared. Now the a is just a constant so I can pull that out of the derivative so this is m a d squared by d t squared of t squared and in general if I take the derivative of t raised to any power n with respect to t that's just n times t to the n minus one. So we could write this as m a and I can split up the two derivatives d by dt of d by dt of t squared. And d by dt of t squared, what's that going to be? T. Say it again, Marissa. T. No, because you have to bring down the n here. So n in this case would be two, so it'd be two t. Does that make sense? 
Okay. So this is 2t. And then when I take the time derivative of 2t, I could pull the 2 out first. So I could write this as m or 2ma times d by dt of t. And Marissa, what's that derivative? The derivative d by dt of t. And in this case is what? T. Sorry, the n that's appearing here, if we're doing this one, n would be equal to what? One. One. And so when I take that derivative, what do I get? One times t to the zero. Oh, so one. One. One times t to the zero, exactly. So then the question we're asking is minus k a t squared equals question mark 2ma. And that's clearly no, because you've got something that depends on time on the left side, but the right side is just a constant. So that's obviously not a solution. Question so far? Now, this differential equation that we're talking about is a second order differential equation. So I'll rewrite it, minus kx equals m d squared x by dt squared is a second order differential equation because it contains a second derivative. Second order differential equations are very common in physics, maybe the most common kind. But it turns out that there is no set procedure in math that guarantees you of finding a solution to a second order differential equation. For first order, you can just by doing an integral. But second order, there's no guaranteed way to find it. There are a number of common things that you can try. And sometimes they work. And sometimes they don't. So no guaranteed method to find a solution of a second order equation. But one good way, one thing to try is to use your mathematical and physical intuition, mathematical abbreviated there, physical intuition to guess a solution. And you guess a solution and you, as we just did, you plug it in to see if it works. So we're about to do this. So again, here's the system. I'm holding it up for you. And I'm going to start it moving. And I want you guys to make a sketch of position versus time. So let's call upward the positive x direction. And I want you to start your sketch at t equals 0 at the time. So notice this is kind of bouncing symmetrically about some point. At the time that it passes through that point, we're going to call that t x equals, uh, that's the t equals 0 point and when it's going upward. So I want it going upward through that point at t equals zero, make a sketch of x versus time. And then I'm gonna ask you all to hold your sketches up. So you're making a graph with x on the vertical axis and t on the horizontal axis and your graph should start here when it's on its way up. Okay, when you're ready, please hold your sketch up to the camera. Okay. Good. Okay, good. So I think most of us are on the same wavelength. Again, what I wanted was that the object would be moving up at t equals zero. And so that leads to a sketch that looks like this. Some of you had it moving down at t equals zero, which is fine. That's just kind of picking a different zero of time. So now that we have this sketch, 
what mathematical function does this look like to you? Sine? Yeah, it looks like a sine function. And let's write that sine function in the most general possible way. So I'm going to say that it has an amplitude A. It has some period capital T. So I'm going to write it down and then I'll explain what I'm writing. So we're, our guess is that x of t may be equals a times the sine of omega t. And remember that the, so let's investigate what the connection is between omega and capital T. When omega t equals 2 pi, the sine function has gone through one complete cycle. Right, so omega t starts at zero. When it reaches 2 pi, you've gone through one cycle. So that means that omega times the period, capital T, is equal to 2 pi, or as usual, omega equals 2 pi over capital T. So this is the angular frequency that we've encountered before. Same formula as that angular velocity for something that's going in a circle. So now let's check whether this guess works. So we're going to plug it in. That is, does minus k times x, which is our guess is a sine omega t, does that equal m times the second derivative with respect to time of x, which is a sine omega t. So I'm going to Again, the A is a constant, so let's pull that out. So this would be MA, and we'll also break up the derivative into two derivatives with respect to time of sine omega t. The derivative with respect to time of omega sine is positive cosine, and in the process, a factor of omega comes out. So this is equal to omega times positive cosine of omega t. So omega is, again, that's a constant. I can pull that out. So this is m a omega d by dt cos omega t. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. And again, it, there's an omega that comes out. So this would be minus sine omega t. So putting that all together, this is minus m a omega squared sine omega t. And again, on the left side, we've got minus k a sine omega t. Now, this looks much more promising than our previous guess that we showed was wrong, because now we've got the same time dependence on both sides of the equation. So at least there is a prayer that things are, are going to work out. So I can cancel the sine omega t from both sides. I can also cancel the a from both sides and the minus sign from both sides. And so that's going to leave me this, sorry, there should be a question mark above this equal sign because we're still checking. k equals question mark m omega squared, which is the same thing as k over m equals question mark omega squared. So that is true if omega equals the square root of k over m. So we just showed that our guess does work, but it only works if we pick the right value for omega. That is, you need to have an uh, oscillation angular frequency that depends on the particular spring constant and the particular mass that you're using. That's quite an important equation in general. We don't have time to explore it much in this course, but I'm giving it two stars because you will see it in a lot of other contexts. We did already use it once. I kind of referred forward to it in our discussion of quantization of vibrational energies. Questions? 
So again, that's as far as we're going to go with this. But hopefully, when you hear that term differential equation, you realize, oh, that's just an equation that involves a function and its derivatives. One way that I might get a solution is by guessing. But there are other tricks that people can try to try to find the solution. Sometimes, a lot of times in research level um, theoretical physics, the only way to find a solution is by doing a numerical computation on a computer. So you can't find a closed form solution. You can only find an approximate solution with a computer. All right, that's a good place for us to stop for today and therefore for the whole course, except that I will see some of you hopefully for the optional question and answer session at the same time on Monday. Thank you.